everyone. Hope you're all okay. Um, I'm Andy Holday. I'm the Chief Executive here at the RSA. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the great room here at the RSA, as well as those online. Uh, this has been live streamed to hundreds of people externally too, to this very special uh, event. Uh, you may have spotted it's been quite a big week, right? Um, uh, quite pleased not still not to be at the Bank of England. Um, <laughs> I think they're quite pleased too, actually, as it turns out. Um, but let me tell you, those issues are but a little local difficulty relative uh, to the ones our speaker tonight has spent a whole lifetime uh, exploring. And he joins us this evening to explore um, perhaps the biggest question or questions of them all, uh, which is how to secure a viable and flourishing future for humanity uh, on this, our only planet, at the moment. Um, so, Lord Martin Rees, uh, as you all know, is one of the UK's most eminent scientists. Uh, he's a globally renowned cosmologist. He's one of the most respected and influential public figures, and a leading advocate, of course, of science's place at the heart of our common culture. He's a former master of Trinity College, Cambridge, a former president of the Royal Society and co-founder of the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. He's been Astronomer Royal, uh, probably the best job title in the world, <laughs> uh, since 1995. And of course, he's the author of many books, the most recent of which He's here this evening to discuss with us. Uh, in If Science is to Save Us, Martin argues that there's no scientific impediment to securing uh, that sustainable future for us all. The biggest problems we face are sourced from us, that is to say, humans, uh, but so too are the solutions. And if we are to thrive and prosper as a species, we're going to need some long-term thinking, indeed long-term action, guided by science, yes, but also by the collective human values we all, all, have a role in setting and in shaping, and no one exemplifies that setting and shaping of human values uh, better than Martin. This is the kind of argument that chimes beautifully with this place, the RSA. That's been at the heart of what we've been doing since the 18th century. It's at the heart of what we're doing today through our Design for Life programme, the regeneration uh, of people, of place uh, and of planet. I've had the good fortune over the years to attend a number of Martin's talks and indeed discuss the issues with him periodically. I can say without a trace of doubt that Martin is one of, if not the, best equipped person I've ever met to provide the wise counsel we need in these troubled times to harness the very best of what science innovation has to offer, but to do so uh, with that human touch, the touch we'll need, I think, Martin, if science is indeed to save us. Um, Martin's going to speak for 25 minutes, half an hour or so, give or take, then we'll open it up to questions from here in the audience and of course online, so have those poised, I'll get through as many of those as possible, but without further ado, let me welcome to the stage with huge pleasure, uh, Lord Martin Rees. Martin. <laughs> Well, thank you, Andy. It's a great privilege to be here. Um, having the title Astronomer Royal, I was sometimes asked, did I do the Queen's horoscopes? <laughs> and I had to say no. But even though I'm not an astrologer, I'm today going to venture some predictions, but tentatively. Because scientists are poor forecasters, though perhaps rather better than economists. <laughs> My theme will be that our future will depend crucially on how science develops, whether it's applied widely or wisely or dangerously, and how scientists relate to politics and the wider public. 
But let's first focus on two trends we can predict, even with a cloudy crystal ball. First, the world in 2050 will be more crowded. 50 years ago, world population was about 4 billion. It's now nearly 8 billion. The growth has been mainly in Asia and Africa. But despite doom rate and forecasts by Paul Ehrlich and others, food production has kept pace with rising population. Famines still occur, but they're due to conflict or maldistribution, not overall scarcity. The number of births per year is going down now in most countries, but not in all, and people are living longer. So world population is forecast to keep on rising to around 9 billion by 2050. And to properly nourish all of them will require further improved agriculture, low-till water conserving and GM crops, and maybe some dietary innovations, converting insects and maggots, highly nutritious and rich in protein, into palatable food and making artificial meat. To quote Gandhi, to be enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Projections beyond 2050 are uncertain. Falling infant mortality, urbanization, and women's education trigger the demographic transition towards lower birth rates. But there would be, or could be, countervailing cultural influences. And if, for whatever reasons, families in Africa remain large, then according to the UN, that constant population could double again by 2100, from 2 billion to 4 billion, thereby raising the global population to 11 billion. Nigeria alone would then have as big a population as Europe and North America combined. Well, optimists say that each extra mouth brings two hands and a brain. But it's the geopolitical stresses of that scenario that are worrying. As compared to the fatalism of earlier generations, those in, four, in poor countries now know via the internet what they're missing. And migration is easier. So wealthy nations, especially those in Europe, should urgently instigate a mega marshal or lend lease plan for Africa, and not just for altruistic reasons. So the world's getting more crowded. And the second firm prediction, it's getting warmer. In contrast to population issues, climate change is certainly not under-discussed, though it is under-responded to. The message of the sixth IPCC is stark. Under business as usual scenarios, we can't rule out later this century, really catastrophic warming and tipping points triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice cap. So why is the political response so torpid? Politicians focus on immediate threats like COVID-19, where, of course, vaccine science has been our salvation. But they won't prioritise the global and long-term measures needed to deal with climate change, because its worst impact stretches beyond the time horizon of political and investment decisions, and because also it's nations far away from ours that need the help most. We're like the proverbial boiling frog, contented in a warming tank until it's too late to save itself. But to insert a bit of good cheer, there is a win-win roadmap. Nations like ours should accelerate R&D into all forms of low-carbon energy generation and into other innovations where parallel progress is crucial especially storage, batteries, compressed air, pumped storage, hydrogen, etc., and smart transcontinental grids. Prioritising these technologies should ease Europe and North America's path to sustainability. But there's an even more important motive. The faster these clean technologies advance, the sooner will their prices fall so they become affordable to poor nations in the global south. And those nations can't reach acceptable living standards without generating more power than they do today. Not only will their currently low per capita energy needs have to rise, unlike 
is the case here, but they will collectively harbour a billion more people by 2050 than today. So bending the trajectory of CO2 emissions from those countries is crucial. They must be enabled to leapfrog speedily to clean energy, just as they leapfrog to mobile phones without ever having had landlines. It would be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young engineers than devising clean and economical energy systems that can achieve net zero for the entire world. And another thing, if humanity's collective impact on land use and climate pushes too hard, the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We're destroying the book of life before we've read it. Already, there's more biomass in chickens and turkeys than in all the world's wild birds. And the biomass in humans, cows and domestic animals is 20 times that in wild mammals. Biodiversity is crucial to human well-being. <coughs> but the riches of our biosphere surely has value in its own right. And to quote the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. And my Cambridge colleague, Sir Partha Desgupta, has prepared for the forthcoming UN conference in Montreal a 500-page report on the climate, population and biodiversity nexus. It's a manifesto that deserves as much attention, I think, as Nick Stern's climate report 15 years ago. We should be evangelists for new technology, not Luddites. <coughs> Without it, the world can't provide food and sustainable energy for an expanding and more demanding population. But many of us are, of course, anxious that it's advancing so fast that we may not properly cope with it and that we'll have a bumpy ride through this century. Nuclear weapons, of course, are a fearsome legacy of 20th century physics. But this century, it's the biosciences that will be more transformative. Advances in microbiology, diagnostics, vaccines and antibiotics offer prospects of containing natural pandemics. But the same research raises, and this is my number one fear, the prospect of, for instance, engineered pandemics. Back in 2012, groups in Wisconsin and in Holland showed it was surprisingly easy to make the flu virus both more virulent and more transmissible. To some, this was a scary portent of things to come because such so-called gain-of-function experiments can be done for coronaviruses too. And the CRISPR-Cas9 technique for gene editing is hugely promising. But there are ethical concerns about experiments on human embryos, for instance, and worries about possible runaway consequences of so-called gene drive, programs to wipe out species, species as diverse as mosquitoes and grey squirrels. Regulation of biotech is needed. But I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed <coughs> on prudential or ethical grounds can't be enforced worldwide any more than the drug laws or the tax laws can be. And whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that's a nightmare. Whereas an atom bomb can't be built without conspicuous special purpose facilities, biotech involves small scale dual use equipment. And the rising empowerment of tech savvy groups, by biotech especially, will pose an intractable challenge to governments. The global village will have its village idiots and their idiocies can now cascade globally. Measures to keep us safe will aggravate the tension between freedom, privacy and security. I think privacy will have to give. These concerns are fairly near term, within 10 or 15 years. But what about 2050 and beyond? On the bio front, we might then expect two things. First, a better understanding of the combination of genes that determines key human characteristics 
and the ability to synthesize genomes that match these features. This could prompt serious attempts at human enhancement. But do we want biohackers to play God on the kitchen table, as it were? Should we worry if designer babies become conceivable in both senses of that word? And incidentally, among ways of redesigning ourselves, research on ageing is being seriously prioritised. <coughs> Will the benefits be incremental? Or is ageing a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension would plainly be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications, especially if it happens just to some privileged group. But it may happen along with human enhancement in other forms if it can't be regulated. Indeed, some American billionaires have set up three labs called Altos Laboratories, two in California and one here in Cambridge, to focus on this. But when these guys were young, they wanted to be rich. Now they're rich, they want to be young again, and that's not so easy. <laughs> and it's not clear that we want them to succeed. But what about another transformative technology apart from bio? Robotics and AI. Already AI, because of its ever-rising processing speed, can cope better than humans with data-rich, fast-changing networks. Traffic flows, electric grids, etc. The Chinese could have an efficient planned economy that Marx could only dream of. And AI can help science too with understanding protein folding and drug development, and perhaps even tackle the ten-dimensional geometry that could settle where the string theory can really describe our universe. That may be too hard for humans. The implications for our society of AI are already ambivalent. If we're sentenced to a term in prison, recommended for surgery, or even given a poor credit rating, we would expect the reasons to be accessible to us and contestable by us. If such decisions were entirely delegated to an algorithm, we'd be entitled to feel uneasy, even if presented with compelling evidence that on average the machines make better decisions than the humans they've usurped. But clearly machines will take over much of manufacturing and retail distribution. And they can supplement, if not replace, many white-collar jobs. Routine legal work, accountancy, computer coding, medical diagnostics, and even surgery. In contrast, some skilled service sector jobs, plumbing and gardening, for instance, require non-routine interactions with the external world, and they'd be among the hardest to automate. The digital revolution generates enormous wealth for innovators and global companies. But preserving a healthy society will surely require redistribution of that wealth. As an obvious need is to generously publicly fund vastly more carers for the old, the young and the sick. It's surely a win-win if those displaced from mind-numbing work in call centres and Amazon warehouses can transfer to more fulfilling work as carers. But let's look still further ahead. Acquiring common sense won't be so easy for AI. It works by learning from huge data sets, but observing actual people in real homes or workplaces isn't so easy. A machine will be sensually deprived by the slowness of real life. It will be like watching trees grow is for us. What if a machine without common sense, develop a mind of its own? Would it stay docile or go rogue? Futuristic books portray a dark side where AI gets out of its box, infiltrates the internet of things and pursues goals misaligned with human interests. Some AI pundits, like say Rodney Brooks, the inventor of the Baxter robot, think it'll be a long time, fortunately, before artificial intelligence need worry us more than real stupidity, and that we should worry more about breakdowns and bugs in the machines than about being outsmarted by them. 
But others take this seriously. The Vizmi futurologist Ray Kurzweil argued in his book The Age of Spiritual Machines that humans will someday transcend biology by merging their brains with computers. In old-style spiritualist parlance, they would go over to the other side. But Kurzweil is worried that his nirvana won't happen in his lifetime. So he's one of those who want to be preserved until it's reached. There's a company in Arizona that will freeze and store your body in liquid nitrogen so that when your mortality is on offer, you can be resurrected or your brain downloaded. I was surprised, incidentally, to find that three academics I know in England had gone in for this so-called cry cryonics. Two had paid the full whack, the third had taken the cut price option of wanting just his head frozen. <laughs> <laughs> and I was glad all three are from Oxford, not from my university. <laughs> I told them I'd rather end my days in the English churchyard than in an American refrigerator. <laughs> Well, my academic interest is in space, so I hope you'll forgive a brief di digression. Space technology is pervasive today. We depend on it every day for sat-nav, communication, and weather forecasting. And it's in space, a hostile environment for humans, that robots have the greatest scope and will raise the fewest problems. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by flotillas of miniaturized probes with AI capability. And robotic fabricators will assemble large structures, for instance, giant telescopes or solar energy collectors, in space or on the moon. The practical need for astronauts gets ever weaker with each advance in robotics and miniaturization. So will human spaceflight have a resurgence? The moon landings are over 50 years in the past. They're ancient history to the younger generation, but they're still the apex of human space exploration. So will there ever again be inspirational Apollo-style projects? NASA's man program ever since Apollo has been impeded by public and political pressure to be exceedingly risk-averse. The shuttle, for instance, failed twice in 135 launches, a less than 2% failure rate, but each of those failures was a national trauma. And because of the safety culture, NASA will confront political obstacles in achieving any grand goal within a feasible budget. Sending humans to Mars with six months of provision and supplies for the return journey is immensely more expensive and hazardous than going to the moon. I argued in a recent book that human missions, if done at all, should be left to private enterprise, Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. They could operate a cut price program far riskier than Western nations could impose on publicly funded civilians. Distributing many volunteers, some perhaps even accepting one-way tickets, driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers and the like. And by 2100, intrepid thrill-seekers may have established bases independent from the Earth. Musk himself says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> He's now 51, so 40 years from now, good luck to him. <laughs> but don't ever expect mass emigration from Earth. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic, the ocean bed, or the top of Everest. Here I disagree with Musk and my late colleague Stephen Hawking. It's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from the Earth's problems. Dealing with climate change on Earth is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. There's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. Well, after this... Uh, flaky futurism, I'd like to conclude by spending five minutes refocusing on present-day policies, here in the UK in particular. What should be our message to the younger generation who will live to the 22nd century? It's surely that there's no scientific impediment to achieving a sustainable world 
where all enjoy a lifestyle better than those in the West do today. We live under the shadow of new hazards, but these can be minimised by a culture of responsible innovation, especially in fields like energy, biotech and AI. Exploiting the potential of the scientific endeavour needs ambitious and stable funding, of course. And we're used here to a system where research is concentrated in universities. This system prevails in the US and the UK, but not everywhere. Although a research university was pioneered by Humboldt in Germany, most of that nation's best researchers are now in Max Planck institutes. And in France, they're civil servants in CSR, CNRS institutes. So the kind of academic career that mixes teaching and research is an Anglo-Saxon model, though it's now widely adopted in the Far East. And it's my impression that the encroachment of audit culture and other pressures are rendering our universities less propitious environments for research projects that demand intense and sustained effort. I think dedicated standalone labs may be preferable, though there is a downside then insofar as they remove talented researchers from contact with students. And of course the UK has already developed special strength in biomedical sciences because of our famous labs which allow full-time long-term research where government funding is massively supplemented by the Wellcome Trust, the cancer charities, and the strong pharmaceutical industry. And I think we need similar labs to focus on innovations in clean energy. The Faraday Centre for Battery Technology is perhaps one that should be uh, adopted more widely. And to properly exploit new discoveries, these research institutions must be complemented, of course, by organisations in the public or private sector which can offer adequate manufacturing capability when it's needed. This fortunate concatenation certainly proved its worth in the recent pandemic, in vaccine development and production and analysing virus variants, etc. And it's imperative likewise to foster expertise in energy, climate and the cybersphere. Indeed, in all the fields of natural and social sciences needed to tackle the global challenges I mentioned earlier. This is where the UK should punch well above its weight. The problems of raising venture capital in this country are well recognised, leading to the premature foreign takeover of promising start-ups. Own goals jeopardising the government's new growth agenda. And what about public policy? Scientists have an obligation, I think, to promote beneficial applications of their work and to warn against the downsides. But they mustn't forget that in domains beyond their special expertise, they speak just to citizens with no enhanced authority. Policy judgments about nuclear weapons, energy, environment or health are seldom purely scientific. They involve ethics, economics and social policies as well. So actual decisions should be preceded by wide public discussion. And for this discussion to rise above the level of tabloid slogans in the democracy, we all need a feel for the key concepts underlying modern technology, an understanding of the natural world, including humans, and enough numeracy to avoid being baboozled by statistics. Moreover, Science's findings are not only the basis of everyday technology, they should surely be part of our common culture. And I think their essence can be conveyed using non-technical words and simple language. And this, if you want to have responsible citizens in democracy, should be a key mission for our education system. The challenges I've discussed stemming from misuse of technology are global. Coping with COVID-19 plainly is. And the threats of potential shortages of food, water and natural resources and of transitioning to low carbon energy can't be solved by each nation separately. Nor can the regulation of potentially threatening innovations, especially those spearheaded by globe-spanning commercial conglomerates. Indeed, a key issue is whether, in a new world order, nations need to give up more sovereignty to new organisations along the lines of the International Atomic Energy Authority 
or the um, uh, World Health Organization. Yes, I've lost my last page. Okay. Yeah, yes. Um, universities should offer their staff's expertise, not only for this educational uh, venture, but also to assess which of these scary scenarios, echo threats or risks for misapplied technology can be dismissed as science fiction. Unfortunately, some can. And how best to avoid the serious ones. As was mentioned in the introduction, we in Cambridge have set up a centre to address just these issues. But politicians will only act long term if they think the public's on side. That's why it's crucially important to uh, ensure the public is aware of these concerns. Unsurprisingly, it's the young who expect to live into the end of the century whose clamour for action on climate and environment is loudest and surely welcome. And their leverage on voters and the media has been amplified, again fortunately, by charismatic individuals. And I'd highlight a disparate quartet of influencers. Pope Francis, David Attenborough, Bill Gates and Greta Thornburg. They together have helped voters to raise this issue on the agenda and politicians therefore to take it more seriously. So, finally, this pale blue dot in the cosmos, where we live, is a special place. It may be a unique place. It existed for 45 million centuries, and its potential future is even longer. But we're its stewards at a specially crucial century. We're deep in the Anthropocene, where our species can determine whether uh, there is an amazing future or whether it's all snuffed out. That's an important message for us all. We need to think globally, we need to think rationally, we need to think long term. We need to be, as it were, good ancestors, empowered by 21st century technology, but guided by values that science alone can't provide. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Martin, for that absolutely spellbinding lecture and presentation. Um, so much there to get our teeth into. And do prepare your questions um, for Martin, either online or in the room. But while you're thinking of them, let me perhaps kick us off, mm -hmm. Martin. And I want to, um, in your book, um, which is fantastic, by the way, end of chapter one, you have this brilliant H.G. Wells quote, Mm -hmm. I hadn't come across, which is, um, we're in a race between education and catastrophe. I wondered, you'd hinted at this a bit, but what needs to change in education to make sure we win that race, do you think, Martin? Mm -hmm. Well, I think to make sure that everyone is aware of the longer term. Um, you know, some economists may discount the future, but people with children and grandchildren do care about what happens at the end of a century. And I think one has to uh, ensure that um, that uh, concern is widespread and is bolstered by awareness of what the real problems are and how to deal with them, uh, so that uh, um, as voters, they will support governments who actually uh, do something about this. I think the problem is that uh, um, uh, it, uh, Mr. Juncker, the EU, said, um, uh, as a politician, uh, we know what we want to do, we don't know how to get re-elected when we've done it. And that's a, that, that, that is a problem. We've got to change that. We've got to ensure that politicians uh, know um, uh, how they can get re-elected by doing the right thing. To give a very small example, um, uh, Michael Gove um, introduced non-reusable drinking straws when he was a DEFRA. A very small thing, but it was motivated by re reducing uh, pollution of the oceans by plastics. Now, he wouldn't have done that had it not been that he knew that millions had watched David Attenborough's programmes 
which among other things showed an albatross returning to its nest, coughing up for its young, not long for nourishment, the bits of plastic. That was an iconic picture, rather like the uh, polar bear and the melting ice flow as it was for climate change. And, uh, and so that was an example where a minor bit of legislation uh, could be done knowing that there was some support. So in a bigger way, we want to uh, uh, exploit attitudes where the public does support a long-term uh, policy. And in terms of when we might start that education, yes. Martin, I mean, does our schooling system provide the right platform for that, do you think? Well, I mean, I, I think, if you, if you think as a scientist, uh, uh, young kids are fascinated by two things, space and dinosaurs. <laughs> Both blazingly irrelevant to everyday life, but fascinating. <coughs> and the, the lesson there is you don't need to make science relevant, you just need to make it fascinating. Uh, but so often, uh, the, the kids by secondary school age lose their enthusiasm um, because there aren't an, enough inspiring teachers. And sadly, of course, in our ultra-specialised system, if they drop science at 16, uh, then uh, they won't be able to return to it at university. That's why we need a baccalaureate or some uh, more general system. Uh, so, so I think the school system needs to um, be able to ensure that people get some basic information as I said, so that they uh, can actually follow arguments and not be bamboozled so easily. Um, but I think the important thing is that they don't need to understand the technicalities. Um, if, uh, as a scientist, I understand the technicality of, my, of my certain fields I specialise in, um, but the key ideas can be expressed without using those technicalities. So it's not hopeless to believe that everyone can uh, have an understanding of the basis of science and uh, um, therefore have a better feel for biodiversity, energy and uh, the dangers of, uh, of, of viruses and, va and uh, the need for vaccines, etc. I think it, it's important that that, that, that sh should happen. Did, coming to, um, I said to, to, to COVID-19, because yes. mm -hmm. in some ways that made... Um, amateur epidemiologists of all of us, yes. mm. and statisticians. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think are the sort of lasting lessons we might take away from that? Maybe yes. both as scientists mm -hmm. and as a kind of wider community. Yeah, yes, well I think the scientists served us very well, not only in, the, in getting the vaccines within one year. Amazing when we don't have one for HIV after 40 years. That was an amazing achievement. Uh, but also in the, uh, the presentations of the public, and Patrick Vallance, um, David Spiegelhalter, and, uh, and all the others, they, they, they did a good job. And so I think that showed that the public was interested. They did care. That's because it was fairly immediate. And so the idea would be that uh, the public should be as informed um, and care as much about the, uh, the slow motion versions of the pandemic uh, like uh, insidious climate change and loss of biodiversity, and also the downsides of these fast available technologies. So I think the COVID episodes showed that, uh, um, that, that the public did care and could understand it, but also incidentally it showed that science itself um, um, doesn't provide certainty. Uh, we know that in the early days it wasn't clear whether masks were a good idea or not, and it eventually settled down. So I think it gave some feel for how scientists um, made progress, but uh, um, just like in any other uh, advancing field, uh, they um, uh, gradually firm up their, their views. Uh, and incidentally, I, I, um, I should have said that even though um, I think it's very important that the public should have uh, a better science education, um, uh, scientists sometimes moan a bit too much um, ab about this, um, uh, but I would say it's equally important that everyone should know our nation's history and should be able to find Ukraine and South Korea on a map. And many people can't do that. So what I'm just saying is if we want to have a proper democracy with proper debates above tabloid slogans, then uh, we need to have uh, um, better sort of a broader education for everyone. Last question from me, then we'll go to the audience. So um, stand ready on that. Mm. Um, last question. So Imagine you just won, Martin, the People's Postcode Lottery, £172 million. Mm -hmm. I assume you didn't. You weren't the winner. I, I wasn't, no. Um, <laughs> and you had to deploy it in some scientific endeavour. 
Where do you think, wh where would you put your money right now to have the biggest societal impact, do you think? Uh, I think probably um, uh, in, in, into climate science because it's a very complicated subject and there has been a, a proposal, for instance, for a, uh, um, a special purpose computer to model climate. Um, and, uh, um, and in fact, we, it's so complicated we can't model it very well. So I would put it towards um, uh, a uh, special purpose computer to actually model the climate so if we really know uh, what uh, happens um, on a local level um, at, uh, when, when the overall global warming occurs. And it's for two reasons. Firstly, that uh, um, if you're a politician in a particular country, you want to know what's going to happen in your country, and your citizens of the country want to know. So we need to have a sort of fine-grained model of the climate. And also, if we are, um, as a rather desperate plan B, having to do some kind of geoengineering, uh, then, of course, to avoid the downsides of that, we certainly need to have very good models. So, so I think I would uh, uh, try and give a boost to uh, um, computer modelling in that particular field. Brilliant. Let's go to the floor and take some questions before we go online. I'll take maybe uh, a set of uh, three. We'll take a, a couple uh, here on this side and then one across on this side. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about the WHO and the, uh, the International Atomic Energy Authority. Clearly, they have no genuine enforcement capability. And I, I just wondered if you see any emergent solution to the, the inability of state-centric national institutions to solve what are genuinely global problems, and there, there is no real global governance model in existence. Yes. Um, well, I've got no expertise, but I think um, uh, uh, they, they can act if they have the the support of the key governments, can't they? And so uh, one would have thought that um, in trying to reduce the risk of, uh, of malign actors reducing dangerous viruses, etc., they would have general support. So I think um, uh, it, it does depend on the c consent of, of governments. Well, I, I just don't see politicians or governments are incentivised to give them sovereignty. Well, surely, if, uh, if, if they realise that... Uh, um, uh, a lone actor can produce uh, a, a virus um, as infectious as uh, COVID-19, but as lethal as, as the Zika virus. They would want to do everything possible to minimise the chance of that happening. And that would involve uh, um, surely support for the WHO uh, in um, uh, aiming to verify that people weren't doing that sort of thing. So, so surely there are cases like that when all the government would support action. <coughs> yeah. Thinking yeah. of, uh, Colin Wright, thinking of your um, cryogenic Oxford colleagues, I note that uh, no post-war Prime Minister has been to Cambridge. Um, <laughs> so can you expect politicians to understand and take on board what you say? Um, well, I, th I think I think uh, I think one can, you know, from uh, some Oxford ones. But I, I would like to say that um, uh, I'm not uh, I, I'm not saying we want a government of scientists. Um, I, I think um, uh, um, you know, scientists are, are specialists. But um, in fact, uh, I say in my book that I'd rather uh, that the prime minister had a PhD in history than a PhD in dentistry, for instance. That's what would be more more relevant. And I also note that uh, um, if we think of the politicians who have um, uh, had goodwill towards science and have actually been helpful in science policy. They haven't all been scientists. I think of someone like uh, um, Phil Willis and David Willits, for instance. You know, neither of them scientists, but they've both uh, uh, got a feel for science and done good things. So um, uh, I think um, people from all backgrounds can understand enough about science and why it's important and what the limits are to do what should be done to influence policy. Terrific question here, then I'll go to the um, online. Hi, you, 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 um, you stated very importantly the importance of the illiterate, um, electorate, a scientific, uh, one that understands science. Um, yet we have, we had our education minister saying that we had, we've had enough of experts. And we have the likes of Trump and Bolsonaro and various 
saying that COVID-19 vaccinations turns you into a copper mm. what, what can we do to counteract that? I mean, I know that David Attenborough, when asked about what do you do about Trump, famously said, perhaps we could shoot him or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's true that social media um, have proved an impediment um, in the sense that uh, in the old days, um, most information reached the public having been filtered through responsible journalists who would sort of muffle the crazy extremes, whereas now the opposite happens. The uh, um, extremists um, get lots of hits which drive um, people to even more extreme stuff. So, so I think there is a problem. Uh, it's not just Trump. I mean, this is a general um, uh, consequence of, um, of, of the internet and social media. I don't know how we can d deal with that. I think we just have to hope that uh, uh, people will become a bit more critical. I mean, you know, if, if you're facing um, some um, uh, uh, need for serious medical attention, um, I think most people realise that you shouldn't attach equal weight to everything on the internet. In that context, they will try hard and probably successfully to find a website which is reliable. And we just hope that uh, um, despite the, um, uh, the noise level raised by all these extreme views, um, they will manage. But I think um, uh, social media have a severe downside. Uh, but of course, they, they do have benefits. Um, and of course, um, uh, um, the possibility of lifelong learning and education by distance learning, which is facilitated by the internet, etc., is something which is going to be more and more important. Yes, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Hopefully, the next generation will be a little bit more savvy when it comes to posts and. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to go uh, online, Martin, for a couple of questions, if yes, that's okay. Yes. Um, this builds on the previous question, actually, um, which is given the wicked problems you've set out and science's role in helping mm -hmm. solve them, do you feel scientists like yourself, Martin? should be more politically active, advocating mm -hmm. uh, for particular positions. Could you be the first Cambridge-educated Prime Minister, <laughs> Martin? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I was, I've partly answered that uh, uh, in response to an earlier question. Uh, um, I, I don't think scientists uh, need to dominate in politics to the extent they do perhaps in Singapore, um, but uh, we, we, want, we want rather more, I, I, I would say, um, but uh, uh, I do think that scientists should engage with the public um, and uh, by, by giving, giving lectures and, um, uh, uh, and writing for general readership. Uh, I think they should do that. But, uh, but I do think that uh, it's important, that's why I mentioned my, my, my four charismatic figures. You, know, you need more people like that um, who um, can get through to a wider public um, and can amplify our voice. And so I think... Uh, um, uh, it, we, we, can, we can do our bit by, by writing and speaking, etc. But we can do more if we can uh, um, uh, provide input for those who really have a following of millions already and they can amplify our voice. But certainly we should engage with and aim to uh, get our ideas through to the wide public. Part of our job. A second question online here. It's a very interesting one, actually, which is um, you've, you've mentioned, emphasised the role of uh, values and ethics alongside the hard science mm -hmm. in driving change and improvement. The question is, but given cultural differences mm -hmm. across countries, yes. how do we navigate those in arriving at a generally global solutions to the global problems you've set out? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's the, 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 there some context where, um, like, avoiding climate change and lots of and mass extinctions where everyone agrees. But I think if we, if we think of um, uh, genetic modification and all that, then clearly there are going to be cultural differences. Some, um, uh, uh, what's happened now, I think most people would say that um, the CRISPR-Cas9 technique of gene editing is okay if it removes one gene which has harmful consequences, like give you Huntington's disease or something. I think most people think that's okay. Um, and uh, uh, most people think that um, 
um, probably um, GM crops are okay uh, if they're done by gene editing and not involving transfer from different species. But if, if you get to more general kinds, then there's a division. Um, some people would say you can uh, um, aim at human enhancement by genetic <coughs> gen modification. Others would say that you should only <coughs> use genetic modification to remove handicaps. So that's, that's an example. And I, I just uh, um, uh, feel we, we have to live with that. And the different countries will have a different laws and different balance, as they do already for GM crops. Yeah. Quite so. Back in the room then, um, let's pick up some questions. Maybe uh, here at the back, I think. Yes. So there, his hand was up first, and then we'll go down. Yes. Wander further forward. Hello, Martin. We have spoken to each other before. The answer to this question is: the whole humanity will agree that we all are living, breathing, sustaining in only one container, environmentally controlled by the layers of ozone gases. Yes. Once we convince this to the humanity by using the latest technology, VR, AI, and others you mentioned earlier on. And I'm sure under your leadership, if you write a proposal with the scientists of the Oxford and Cambridge and other <laughs> universities, the research councils, they will definitely, definitely go ahead for that. I can assure you that. Mm. I, I think so. You probably overestimate the uh, influence of academics <laughs> uh, on, the, on the wider public. I, I, w I wish what you say were true. And uh, we should bang on and campaign, um, but uh, uh, to make people aware of, of, of these issues and the fragility of our, our world and our interconnectedness, all these things um, are important and we should do this. But I think uh, it's still a big ask to get everyone to accept this, uh, especially, I would imagine, people in the uh, disadvantaged parts of the world who have so much, such serious immediate problems that it's a big ask to... Uh, uh, get them to care about what happens 50 years in the future. But we must try. So, As I'm hidden, I'll move out of the shadows. It's a very simple question, but I have to introduce it. Um, I'm a graduate in chemistry from the other place, yes. uh, quite a long time ago. And what I have noticed over recent years is that the scientific faculties in Oxford have turned from being, if you like, an academic ivory tower to being outward turned and engaging with societal problems, mm -hmm. not only because they regard that as necessary, but actually because they find it stimulating mm -hmm. and encouraging. They want yes. to do it. I haven't noticed in the same way a corresponding move in the humanities faculties, and I'd just like to ask your view on how science, on the one hand, might join hands with the confrere in the humanities to move this problem forward, because many of the things you've talked about have a scientific solution, but require the advent mm -hmm. of thinking from the humanities in order to implement. Y yes, yes. Well, that's a as it were, STEAM, not STEM, and S-T-A-M is the acronym that brings in the arts to, to STEM. I, I agree with you. Um, first, on um, the changing atmosphere in science departments, um, I think uh, it's a good thing that um, uh, uh, science departments are um, trying to aid the useful exploitation of their discoveries. That's fine. Um, and I hope this can be done in universities. Um, but I, I did express my concern that uh, um, in universities, um, uh, the conditions are getting less propitious for long-term thinking. In fact, I, I wrote an article for Research Fortnight a couple of years ago, and uh, you know, the editor makes up the headline. And the headline that it gave my article was, why I'm glad I'm not a young academic. <laughs> and and, and uh, this was at, um, comparing the situation of my young colleagues, starting now with the, when I was young 50 years ago, um, I think they have a nastily competitive atmosphere, more audit culture, uh, etc. And uh, I really hope some of that can be reversed, because the risk is that um, uh, the um, uh, people who want to keep in academia, uh, those who um, are ambitious and want to make an impact by their, 19, by their 30s, um, they will be the ones who leave. Because promotion is slow, they will feel constrained. 
and so we lose just the people we want to keep in academia. And so I really hope that the policy, uh, all of the ref and all this stuff, which uh, which really constrains us, uh, will be eased. It's, uh, it was developed in the 1980s with good intentions, but it become a monster constraining too much. So, so I think uh, um, we, we've got to ensure that um, departments of, of science um, uh, uh, do become opened up and attractive and offer chances to young people. In the humanities, which was your, your question, sir, um, I, I think, um, again, um, there's a, uh, a need for humanities to open up because, again, um, uh, what the young acad academics in the humanities, um, they, they feel that getting their career depends on publishing papers in particular obscure journals and getting a monograph published, etc. And they get no credit for uh, interacting with the wider community, etc. So the criteria which are used in assessing academics and promoting them should surely be broadened. And I think it's almost more true in the humanities, uh, where there's a focus on um, uh, getting published in particular journals, um, uh, etc. And uh, it's rather f uh, um, uh, frustrating if it takes years to get a journal uh, article published and all that. So I think in the humanities, um, uh, the, the, it will be widened. In fact, um, I mentioned in my book um, a quote from uh, probably the best report on universities, which was the Robbins Report uh, back in the 1960s, um, w which led to the first burst of expansion in universities. Um, and uh, it said that there were three duties of an academic, uh, research, teaching, and reflective inquiry, which meant really being a broad scholar and, uh, uh, and, and thinking about that. Now, reflective inquiry has been squeezed out. And I think it's rather, rather sad. And so I think it's sad if the people in humanities departments are focused on uh, their very narrow scholarly area without feeling it's important to uh, uh, be able to teach over a far broader canvas. Now, the witching hour is upon us, but I'm going to bust my budget um, <laughs> and uh, take two last questions uh, on this side here and the gentleman behind, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. So, um, sir, uh, a couple of years ago, you were, I think you were the president or the chair of the Association for Science Education. Um, yes. And I guess most of us don't have degrees in particle physics, but most of us went to school. Um, so I want to ask you, what would you do in terms of changing science education primary and secondary level so that people are a bit more literate rather than vocational? Yes, yes. Um, uh, well, I think first to get more teachers, um, uh, and I think um, uh, uh, the, the moves to get people in middle age to move into teaching um, are, are very good. I mean, the, the, uh, Lucy Kellaway has pioneered this and there are others. And one could think of people, say, who've been uh, officers in the Royal Engineers in the Army, who'd be wonderful physics teachers if, if they retired in their mid-40s, etc. So I think to, uh, uh, to get more people into teaching who've had experience in other walks of life will be a, a good thing. Um, and, uh, and I think um, one can make use of um, distance learning and, and the media. But uh, I did say, I remember in my, in my presidential lecture, when I, when I did this, that um, uh, younger people had a disadvantage because uh, when, uh, when I was young, um, you could understand uh, things like a motorbike engine, um, things like that. You could take them apart and put them together uh, and also other things that we, we depended on as, and, and sort of kids. Whereas now, uh, the um, uh, things that uh, are crucial to young people, um, smartphones, etc., are so complicated, they can't take them apart and put them together again. So, indeed, the, the contact with uh, um, uh, mechanical things, which you can take apart and understand and put together, uh, is, is less than now. And, uh, and that's uh, uh, inevitable, but that's uh, an impediment, I think, to getting people into teaching. But most people of the older generation um, got into teaching, got in, in, into science because they played and took things apart. And going right back in history, um, uh, Darwin collected beetles, um, Newton um, uh, un was fascinated by windmills, the high tech of his time. Uh, so it's, it's harder now for young people to um, uh, uh, do, do that sort of thing. We've got to make, make it easier. And also, it's sad if uh, they're so cut off from nature. Um, uh, obviously, being an astronomer, I'm uh, a supporter of dark skies campaigns to make sure that uh, young people can see a dark sky. 
And it's rather sad that m most young people can, can neither see a dark sky nor a bird nest, bird's nest. And I think uh, uh, one, one should have uh, teaching which does somehow enable them to uh, uh, get that sort of experience. The last question here at the, at the back. Thank you. Um, you make inspiring arguments, but I'm a little bit concerned about the logistics of making the energy transition to support society, which is sort of intrinsically energy intensive. Yes. Because it seems we're going to need an awful lot of materials to do that. And even if the politics is with us, there are quite large infrastructural constraints. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, no I, cer I certainly agree that this is, this is a challenge. I mean, first of all, if we're going to use uh, renewable energy, we need to have storage, not just overnight, but for six months, seasonal storage. And, and, and that's uh, a priority to develop that more cheaply. So uh, there are going to be these needs to make it e economical. But I think perhaps you're thinking about a different concern, which is the um, rare earths and the raw materials which are needed for our technology, uh, which... Uh, um, can't be uh, mined without despoiling uh, the landscape to a significant extent. So, uh, so I think it, it, is going to, it is going to be a challenge, um, but, um, but no worse than coal mines in, uh, in the long run. Um, uh, but we do have to um, uh, ensure that we can get clean energy economically, um, and uh, uh, this requires storage if you're dependent. I mean, as far as nuclear is concerned, I think uh, there's a, the, the, well, you, 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 uh, uh, I think you're in the 50% that thinks it's a bad idea, but this is an example of an issue which divides people at all levels of expertise. Um, uh, among lay people and experts, there's uh, a different view about uh, whether fourth generation nuclear fission uh, is a good idea to develop or not. We don't know. We don't know. Um, but um, if we don't have nuclear, uh, then we need storage, obviously. Um, otherwise, we don't have a base load. We should definitely wrap things up as we're five minutes yeah. over. It's what a fantastic mm -hmm. session that has been. Um, I apologise, not getting all the questions. I'd like Martin to stay around a little bit afterwards. Yes. You can mm -hmm. catch him in the corner. Yes, and, and if sign you're lucky, signing books. Yeah. You, you can both buy and sign. Have <laughs> um, yeah. Martin sign your books yeah. and start by signing mine. Yeah. Any second now. Mm -hmm. uh, for everyone watching online, um, Thanks for coming along. Thanks for your questions. If you go into the chat, apparently, there's a special link to get a, an event book discount. Um, so you you're not missing out either, as well as lots of stuff about the RSA, of course. And let me just end. I was reading your book, Martin. It ends on a very optimistic note, with an optimistic quote, mm. in fact, yes. Yes. Uh, from Margaret Mee, which I thought I'd share with you, because it's, it's one to mm. bear in mind in these troubled times. And the quote runs... Uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Please join me in thanking the wonderful Martin Rees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.